Hey, welcome to episode 9 of Worth 1000 Words, where I write a 1000 word short story based on a piece of artwork. If you're new here, my name is Jason and I'm a fiction writer. And today I am listening to the soundtrack of The Lighthouse by Mark Corvin. This one, when I saw it, it was trending on, on ArtStation, so immediately I knew I had to jump on it. It's a unique piece of artwork. I like the style and, and I think it might be a little bit of a challenging story to tell. Nothing really hit me at first, but we'll see. All right, well, let's check out the artwork. Today's artwork is by Alexei Igorov. He's a digital artist out of Yakutsk, Russia. It has a look of a, a ship finally coming home, but obviously there's a twist. We have a giant robot instead of a ship, and what looks like a ship's mast or, or even a, a large crucifix in his hand, and then we have the St. Elmo's fire burning on the tips everywhere and there's a guy up there uh looks like he's holding a flag of some kind it looks like a truce flag almost i'm not sure but in the distance we see that that there is a uh, life maybe it's a, a city of some kind so i guess um today i get to figure out who this guy is what he's doing and um it's gonna be an interesting one all right, let's move on to the writing. So this has kind of a hopeful image and I, I wasn't quite sure where I wanted to go, but I think what I decided to do is, is have this be the last moment of the story. And this guy, whoever he was, is, is inside this cockpit and he's, he's dying. And here I'm inside. He's he's uh, entangled with these with these cables and looking at all those what what appeared to me anyway to be uh, TV screens or something like some kind of viewing monitors all over the wall. I don't know if that's the front of the robot's face. It's kind of hard to tell, but I imagined it's uh, viewing screens. And here he's just kind of giving in to his death. He's we don't know who he is, where he's coming from, what his mission is yet. I, I, I clearly don't. Um, I'm just trying to kind of set the stage. I thought that that if this is how it ends, it needs to begin the opposite way. I mean, I think that's one good way to think about storytelling is um, you want the beginning and the end, or or the beginning of the scene and the end of the scene to to have kind of opposite themes. So the beginning is, you know, hopelessness and maybe the beginning and the end is uh, hopeful. And, you know, if you've read any of my stuff, you'll know that I, I like dark stories. And here I have him um, trying to speak and, and there you can see the cursor flashing. I'm definitely, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm definitely contemplating it, but he ends up not being able to speak. And I don't know where this came from. I was just thinking about a, a massive thunderstorm ahead that's going to possibly affect where he is and, and his condition, either push him back down below or rise him up. And the, the gut one, by saying the gods up top, that, that just made me think of old legends and old stories. And, and now I'm starting to, to give this guy some layers. And as I'm writing layers upon layers of earth, so we know that, that this guy was a storyteller of some kind or, or something. And then, um, he manages to, to utter a single syllable, and I, I don't know where that was going. I think I was just trying to show that there was some hope rising in him that he was able to to speak. And now I'm giving him a little more character here that he he did tell stories, these, these old stories, um, and a little bit of world building where I'm talking about people getting caught up in things that, that don't really matter, at least to him, and has destroyed what's left of the earth and here here I decide that this guy is um, like a missionary of some kind I guess I think just the imagery of the the ship's mast that the uh, that the robot is holding reminded me of a cross too much to to let it go and then you know maybe this guy is traveling from island to island or, or shore to shore wherever it may be uh, spreading this lost word of these old stories. 
and I don't know where I was going. I knew I had to get him. I'm, I'm almost at 500 words, and I'm like, okay, I got to get things moving. I got to have something happen. And so I had his, his hand brush like some kind of sensor of some kind inside the robot. Here I randomly established that he killed somebody. <laughs> I really didn't know where it was going. I It's funny. I, I think I didn't want to make this this uh seem too hopeful or, or too like you know this guy's a a very good christian boy if you will and uh he's he's just rising up from from his his literal tomb to succeed but now we know there's something a little darker at play here yeah fresh coat of skull and brain on the console meaning you know signifying that, that he killed him or found him there i think i'm, I'm pretty sure i decide he killed him or implied it anyway and so whereas we we start to feel for this guy at least a little bit, we know a little bit of his background and how he's reminiscing about old times and telling these stories, and, and he seems relatively harmless until we get to this point where I decide he's a killer because that's just where my mind goes, I guess. And I, I decide to set things in motion. I've already established he can't really move very well, so I had to have another force coax him up. And here he's, you know, thinking about just having a taste of water, even though it'll be salt water and kill him. And at this point, I decide that the the storm outside is going to be the catalyst to to get things into motion because I've I've established that <laughs> he's uh, more or less dead. And still, I don't know. I don't know where this is happening. I know I have a dead body. I have this guy who killed this other person in this cockpit. I know that there's a light on the wall, but. Uh, some kind of sensor to, to maybe like turn things on again, I guess, or, or restore power or, or emergency power of some kind. And here we have the water just breaking in. Um, he's, it's a very visceral feeling for him. He, he's feeling it like a thousand, thousand nails. And I think that's a little bit more of a Christian imagery I think I was putting in there. And this is the, the thing that really gets him up out of the water. Puts a little feeling in his in his flesh. Allows his limbs to hold him upright. And here I decided that okay, I've already established there's a there's a some kind of sensor that's going to bring back back power. Is it a touch sensor? I mean, he touched it, but like, is it is it reading fingerprints? Is it reading something else? And I don't know where this came from at all. So <laughs> he's kind of hopeful holding this guy, and then he. Uh, he goes to kiss the forehead, and as we've learned already, that it's it, this guy's skull has been bashed in and it's empty. So he starts eating his brains. Yeah, getting a little, little crazy, I think, because uh, why not cannibals? Why not? And I started to make him speak, but I was like, I'll just keep that out. I want to keep. If I make him talk, I want it to be later, for sure. Because God just kind of like, I mean, it's no better than he gagged. I don't know that it's it's a better phrase. And here I decide, okay, well, a hand's not going to work, so maybe there's a key of some kind. And I go back and, and seed this in a little bit later, or earlier, I mean, to make it work. Luckily, it didn't take a lot of reworking. I was able to just fix a few minor sentences or sentence uh, previously to, to establish that there was more to the, the sensor than just... Uh, you know, it lighting up when touched. And here he's being hurled around, and this this key is is the thing that's going to, you know, it has all of his attention. It's it's uh, it's tumbling in the air. It's pristine. It's unblemished. And here here I'm establishing the the look of it, which um, I will add later. So to give the reader an indication of what he's looking for and why this thing's important. And here he's he's just kind of. It's almost an out-of-body experience at this point, which I think on the brink of death, it's, it's not surprising. And here I finally decide to do it. I, I, I make him a missionary of the true God, whoever that is. It doesn't necessarily have to be the Christian God, but I think that the mast or the, the crucifix that the robot's holding is, is the inspiration for it, so maybe it is. And now, now that he's, he's, uh, he has some flesh in his belly he's he's feeling better he has the signs of of salvation and and that's really invigorating him 
and I just go full God at this point. Um, I, I start. And it was it was nice because I didn't know where I was going, and now that I know who this guy is and what he's about, and it's kind of a realistic. I, well, I should say realistic, but I I wanted to have a you know a polar opposite. I want to have an, a quality, two qualities that that opposed opposed each other. One being good and one being bad, or I guess do whatever it takes to to fulfill your mission. And then I, I personify the the robot here when I say then the voice of God, which you know to him is is just any voice at this point. And then further, I, I dim the lights and just add those you know describe them the, as the eyes of God and another voice. And I'm giving a little bit more information here as if this this robot's computer is reading off details about this approaching civilization ahead. And I don't know. I'm just making making shit up at this point. I have no idea where I'm going in terms of this world building. That's always difficult to do is come up with stuff like that on the spot. I don't know. Is it is it any good? I have no idea. But it's it's vague enough. And now I'm almost at a thousand, so I, I need to get him out of this cockpit. I need to realize this image that you see before you now. And um, yeah, he he climbs out, and I got to get the the flag in his hand. And yes, I do decide it is a a flag of truce. And I, I did go over a lot more than I, I wanted to, but I, I needed to get this ending right. I needed to have it have enough detail to where it didn't seem like an abrupt stop. So I'm gonna have to shave off 50-ish words, it looks like. And I don't know, I was trying to mess around here with some, you know, scripture-like poetry. Uh, maybe maybe it's a quote from, from this book or this Bible, whatever he's doing. Uh, but I'm like, man, I'm at 1,050 words. I got I to gotta end it. I can't have this uh, soliloquy happening right now. I'm not sure how I'm going to cut all of the above because I, I didn't feel like it was too overwritten earlier on. But there's definitely some stuff to cut. So I think that's that's really why I'm hesitating so much is I'm like, okay, how can I end this quickly? I'm 50 words over. And I'm, I decide that I need to establish this, the image of the, whatever this robot's holding in his hands. And, and as St. Elmo's fire goes, right, there has to be light. And I thought that was kind of a cool, perhaps a little cliche ending as the, the beginning of creation where that, that initiates the, the St. Elmo's fire. Or at least he says it and then it happens. Not that he had anything to do with it. So, yeah, I'm just destroying sentences at this point because I'm, I'm killing my darlings because I need to get these words out. And it was easier than I thought it would be, thankfully. I wasn't being uh, too precious. I was trying to shorten. A, a lot of times when I write, and I'm sure you've noticed if you've read any of my stuff or been watching these videos, is that I like to emphasize things. Sometimes I'll repeat phrases or repeat words and then add elements to those phrases just for emphasis. That's just, I guess, part of my voice. I don't know. It just sounds right to me, and I, I like it. Maybe I overuse it. I have no idea. But I think when you're writing a novel or something else like that, it doesn't really matter. Word count isn't a huge problem. But once again, this is a great exercise in taking out words, being brief, because I feel like any story could could benefit from that. Just really paying attention to the words that, that you want to say. Oh, and here, here we go. And that's when I I just added those couple of sentences to show the reader, seed that back in that, you know, this object that he finds inside the head of this, this character is the key. Now it's inside his head. How does it activate? It's notched. I, I, I established there was a depression of some kind there. Too late. Too late to figure out the details. I'm, I'm, I'm pretty happy. I'm just under a thousand words getting close I think I have the the, the heart of the story done and, and I've, I've seeded those details that I needed to put back in there and really I think this is one of the first times or, or one of the few times when I'm doing these 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 free writing exercises that it takes me a, a, a while to get there like in terms of like well what's the key to this thing and so I had to go back so far I've been lucky and, and it just kind of works itself out for the most part as I go and yeah, I was just right here. This is about it. I'm at 998, and we're about to end. He tasted salt. It started on his skin, a film, 
an organism that grew and grew and grew. Nothing he did could wash it off. But what did he have? A dark tomb. Somehow he missed the taste of blood, the taste of life. The screens had burned out long ago, glassy dead eyes now. Cables encircled him. He couldn't move them off, even if he wanted. Inside his chest was the last thing that worked. The last thing that had energy to it. Love. His tomb rocked forward, slid back into a cradle of some kind, not quite able to climb over the lip of the void. He stretched his mouth open. Salt crumbled. He opened his eyes. More salt. It didn't sting anymore. He was becoming part of it. His body had finally relented. His dry tongue circled his dry mouth. Teeth clacked. Could he? No. The gods fought overhead, miles above. A rumble, a crash. But it was a fiction. He knew that. It just sounded nice. Like speaking a legend. An old story. He missed old stories, telling them. He lusted for earth. No matter how solid, metal wouldn't do. Layers upon layers earth had, near endless, leading to a hot core, much like the one that held on inside him. I... Who was that? Him, of course. A husk of the deep baritone he used to possess. The one that told old stories. The ones that people forgot. Caught up in the things that had only brought them down. Destroyed much of what was left. The true stories. But there were shores, lush with starving minds, minds he could fill, if he could only move, rise, finish what he started. He touched the cold hole with the last of his energy. His hand warmed. A light there, a notch. A hemisphere with two notches. It flashed red. Not meant for him. For the man who came before him, when he had first tasted blood. The blank screens weren't the only dead eyes here. He shared this tomb. If there had been light, he would see him. Sprawled on the other side, a fresh coat of skull and brain on the console. Ironically, the man died where one was supposed to look. But with the power gone, it was useless. The lens was most likely far below the surface anyway. As if in response, water trickled from above. He heard it but didn't see it. His throat constricted at the sound. The sea was teasing him now. Although he knew he couldn't drink it, he would. Oh, to die with a wet mouth. The unbeliever had, lucky fool. A mouth of blood, but wet nonetheless. Thunder rolled, boulders across the sky. The energy made its way to the surface during the depths. A hollow silence, a pressure, before everything imploded. Water rushed in. He opened his mouth wide, let it all in. Nails on his skin, a thousand thousand nails, and it tested all the points, working its way over every nerve, every vessel to his wrists. And he was alive. His legs, eager to push his head to the surface, held him up. His mouth breached and he tasted the air. Then the sea brought him a gift. He cradled it like a babe, like the one who they had forgotten. He went to kiss the forehead, but his lips passed through where it should be, and once again he tasted blood. He didn't command his teeth to chew, but they did, ravenously. Eyes rolling back in pleasure, he swallowed the sweet matter. He gagged. A bit of bone lodged in his throat. So this is how he would die. The muscles there worked like the legs of a millipede, working the shape down. The shape was wrong, smooth, spherical. His throat empty for so long, he could sense every angle of its surface. Then something smashed against his tomb, and he was thrown forward nearly out of the water to the waist, and the opposite wall punched him in the chest. The shape was loose, Tumbling in the air above, pristine, an unblemished sphere, except for two protrusions on either side, cylindrical, 
the piece to the puzzle. Dreamlike, floating, his arm that wasn't his arm sprung up, his hand that wasn't his hand grasping, getting hold, such a precious hold. Those old gods wanted him to sing the name of the one true God, because they hurled their great stones again, moving the sea the opposite direction to throw him back in his bed of steel tentacles. They didn't threaten to strangle him. They parted. Oh, what signs, what beautiful signs. Invigorated with the hopes and dreams turned flesh of the other man in his belly, his fingers led the key to its mark. The world ignited, as if the one true God had opened his eyes. He basked in the glory, was thrown to his knees as he should be, as the great machine hummed to life. Then the voice of God said, Five kilometers to surface, prepare for decompression. He felt it, truly felt it. It was as if his chest were to explode, his head to burn away to stardust, an ecstasy flesh could not fathom. The eyes of God dimmed, allowing its disciple to complete his mission. Then, he said, population 2,135, agriculture, light industry of aerofilament, Arrival in 36 minutes, 25 seconds. He found his sustenance at his feet, and he ate. He would need the strength. They must witness him rested, full, clear of mind. The hatch opened with a hiss. The cold breath of all of creation filled his lungs. He climbed the ladder, one leg not quite working, but he made it to the top. There, strapped to the top, was a mark of truce. He straightened it and it served his balance well. The great machine carried him toward the blinking shore, holding the symbol of truth. Let there be light, he said. And there was. Hey, welcome to the end and my final thoughts. Um, if you've made it this far, thank you for sticking with me. I know these videos don't get a ton of views, but um, I'm sure there's a few of you out there anyway that are getting something out of this. Um, so I, I'd like to take a minute to talk about one thing I did learn while writing this is that the the story really wasn't coming to me until, until later. And I had to go back and seed a little bit of information. And luckily, that was not too difficult to do. I think in hindsight, I probably would have done it differently. It doesn't quite 100% make sense in this in this case, but it has to end sometime. I think now a lot of people meticulously outline. I'm kind of somewhere in the middle. I do have an outline when I write. Not these, obviously. These are just on the seat of my pants. But when I'm working on a novel or something longer form, I do have an outline. I've tried meticulously outlining, and that doesn't work for me. I've tried doing the seat of my pants, and that always ends up into uh, territory of too much rewriting, which I'm not a fan of. But here, luckily, it was an easy fix, and I think that that is one thing you can take, is, is don't, don't worry about knowing all of the answers when you're writing something. Trust your gut, trust your subconscious, because that's really where a lot of the good stuff comes from. When I'm sitting there really working on an outline, I feel like none of the good stuff happens for me personally. All of the stuff usually when I write comes out while I'm writing and sometimes I have to rework some stuff as I did here. I don't know, there's something about being in the headspace and in in the location and the setting and like just having that atmosphere of the story, just really getting into the head of everything and everybody. Uh, that's when things just kind of unfold naturally for me and they make sense in the world, they make sense to the character. And for me, working off a bulleted list really just, it, it, it stifles my creativity to a degree. Not that I think pantsing is the answer. As I said, that I feel like can get you in a lot of trouble. Unless you're the kind of person who likes rewriting, then by all means, go for it. Well, anyway, I hope you enjoyed this one. Keep making art. Comment below if you have a suggestion or any thoughts. I'd love to hear it. I will see you in the next one. Bye. If you'd like to read this story in its non-video format, check the link in the description. I didn't add anything else. Promise. Thanks again.